Hello and welcome to this next session, um, this next uh, live stream that we are doing. Today we are doing uh, Flex Entry Level. Uh, last week you would have seen me presenting Flex S Entry Level and we've done a few other sessions between now and then. Uh, but today is all about Flex um, and how to use your console, how to program on the console um, and so on. Now, for today, uh, there will be an assumed knowledge. Uh, that assumed knowledge is of the patching process. We've hosted an entire session on getting your console ready to control how to patch into the console and so on. So we're not going to cover that today, but if you're missing that part uh, within your, your knowledge, do go and find that stream which is available on our social media channels for you to go back and watch. Uh, but for today, as I said, we're going to skip over the patching process and we're going to go straight into how to actually use the console. Now, today we are live streaming to Facebook, uh, YouTube and to Twitter. So do make sure you post your questions, your comments into any one of those various chats um, and they will get through to me and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, but if we are ready to go, let's crack on. So what we've got here, guys, is uh, the setup we will be using for today. Uh, this setup, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, Capture. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll be running uh, Capture as our visualization program, um, and then I am running Phantom Xeros. Okay, Phantom Xeros is the name of our operating system um, for, uh, for, for using the console offline. So, let's go ahead and start. If we take a look uh, here, okay, we're going to first start on how to just do intensity control. Okay? So the most basic thing you can do on the console is control the intensity of a fixture. Okay? Now, the intensity is controlled in many different ways. The first and the most basic way of controlling intensity is by using the faders. Okay, everyone across any console that you use is bound to be used to this method. Chuck up a fader and you're probably going to get some light output. So, you can see here, as soon as I push up some faders, various lights are starting to turn on on my stage. Okay? Now, there's an important thing to note about these faders uh, on our console and across some other consoles as well. In previous times, before LEDs and moving lights were such a big thing, um, it was more that these faders were kind of individual channel faders. And they are still called channel faders, but now it's more kind of fixture per fader rather than channel per fader. So every single fader controls a fixture, not an individual channel. So for example, this one fader here controls an entire moving light. It's just that the only thing that fader controls is the intensity. Okay, so everything else is going to be controlled later on on your touchscreen um, inside the console and using other methods. But the fader is what controls the intensity. So it doesn't matter if it's a moving light, an LED par, a one channel fresnel. Uh, it's all controlled in the same way using the faders. Okay. Now, we can also use the buttons below the faders uh, in conjunction with an intensity wheel. This is also another method that we can use to control the intensity of our fixtures. So, for example, I can use the buttons below the faders when they are in channel mode, okay? And I maybe didn't mention that, but on the right-hand side of your faders here, you've got a fader. Uh, you've got a fader function button and that allows you to change between uh, channels and playbacks. We'll cover playbacks later on, we're, we're just going to cover channels for now. But when they are in channel mode, you can go ahead and click uh, any one of these buttons below the faders. And rather than acting like flash keys, uh, like you would have previously known them, and they do act a bit like that later on in a different mode, but when in channel mode they act like select keys. Okay, so now we are selecting the lights that we want to control uh, on our console. Okay, and you can see this here on my internal screen. So this, this screen here is just showing you a, a, a representation of what's uh, on the internal screen, just a bit bigger. And, uh, and it's showing you that we've got those fixtures selected. Okay, now uh, we could still just go and push up faders, but that defeats the purpose of using the select options. 
Uh, so we could actually go and use the intensity wheel on the console to control those fixtures instead. Now, you will notice that we don't have an intensity wheel on our desk, uh, uh, a physical intensity wheel on the desk, uh, but we do utilize one of these four encoders. Okay, so if you pop into the Z button, which is just here on your console above the arrow keys, the first wheel that you are presented with is the intensity wheel. Okay, so we can go ahead and with this selection of lights, we can go ahead and just dial those up, okay, or dial those down, depending on what you want to do, using the intensity wheel. Now it's important to know actually with the intensity wheel there is an option later on that will we'll show you that you can actually lock that wheel to being on that uh, the, the first left hand wheel all the time so it's always there. Um, the disadvantage to that as you'll notice later on is when we're using LEDs and moving lights we then we would move in from four wheels down to three wheels meaning we've got a little bit less control at one time. So for this process, I won't be locking that wheel to that location, but just note that you can do that, okay? But if you click the Z wheel, the Z button, that is where you go and find the intensity wheel, okay? So moving on to this now, moving on to the next section, we've got the half of the desk, uh, and by far what I use the most um, to control the intensity, especially when I'm using it, and that is the, the syntax. Okay, so let's go ahead and have a look at how the syntax works on the desk. Now, what do I mean by syntax? Okay, syntax is this keypad uh, down uh, down on the console. Okay, this keypad here is referred to as the as the syntax. Okay, so when you watch our uh, any of our videos or you look at any of our manuals, you won't see it referenced to as number pad or keypad. It will be referenced to as the syntax. And the syntax is where it's, it's the easiest way to control your fixtures, okay? Especially when you come onto a desk like the Flex. If you've been watching our sessions on Flex S, for example, uh, you would have noticed we use the faders a lot. But on Flex, because you can have so many lights on the console, I mean, you've got up to eight universes, or 16 universes now as well, across the console, okay? And you can have lots and lots and lots of lights patched in on that. Um, but we can't control them all on faders at one time, so that's why the syntax comes in, into use. So, let's go ahead and start using the syntax. The most basic way to use it is to type the following, 1 at 100, enter. Okay, that is the most basic way of turning on a light using the syntax. Now, hopefully what you saw there was we split that into a section of uh, a three commands, okay, three parts of that command. And that was the first part of the selection was, the first part of the command was the channel selection. Okay, so this is me typing number one, that selected channel number one. Uh, then you have to put the at symbol. Okay, that's the second part of the command. You have to put the at symbol to tell us that you're putting it at an intensity. And then the third part of the command is by defining the intensity that you want it to go to. So that's the three parts, that's how the, the, it's split out, okay? Uh, you always have to finish the command with an enter press, except for two times, and we'll come on to that in a moment, but you always normally finish it with, with an enter press, okay? So let's go ahead and have a look at a few other options with that. Now, I said you have to finish with enter except for two times, and that is by using two shortcuts that we've got on the console using the syntax. So if we type 1 at at, okay, that is the equivalent of typing 1 at 100 enter, okay? So 1 at at is 1 at 100 enter, but it just saves you a few button presses to speed up your operation on the console, okay? So you don't always have to type 1 at 100 enter, and you would have noticed I didn't have to press enter to finish that command, and that's because the console it obviously is programmed to know what a double press of the at symbol is. Now, later on, you'll understand that you need to turn fixtures off yourself, and it's not just a good method of clearing everything out. Um, so we could actually type 1 at 0, enter. So if I go ahead and do that, 1 at 0, enter. That obviously turns that fixture off. I'm just going to go and turn it back on. Um, but actually, there's another shortcut for the... For the uh, 
for turning it off as well, just like turning it on to 100%. So if we do one at dot rather than one at zero enter, okay, that allows you to turn the fixture off. And again, it saves a couple of button presses. So at at is the equivalent of at 100 enter, and at dot is the equivalent of at zero enter. Okay, so they're the two times that you don't have to finish with the enter button when you are typing on the syntax. Okay, great stuff. So there's three buttons that we need to cover within the syntax, and they are here just in the top right hand corner of the syntax view, and that is accept and and through. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, cover the AND button first. Um, you can control multiple lights at one time within the syntax. So for example, I could type 1, AND, 5, AND, 10, and then I could put those at 75, enter. Okay, so using the AND button is a bit like the PLUS button. It, it's, it's adding fixtures onto your selection. Okay, so you can go ahead and control multiple fixtures at one time. Using the through button also allows you to do that, but it actually now allows you to grab a group of fixtures all at one time. So we could say 1 through 10 at 65, enter. Okay, and that goes ahead and selects all fixtures from 1 through to 10. Okay, so hopefully the, the kind of language of the syntax is is pretty self-explanatory and, it, and it's basically just like talking English, so it it, it, it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't be new in the, in that sense. So using the through button, okay, allows you to select all the fixtures one through ten, um, or twenty through thirty, or whatever selection you want to do. Now the accept key, okay, is used in conjunction with the through key. So if we go ahead and type one through ten. And now I'm going to type accept 5 and do at 55, enter. Okay, you can see what that does. So that selects all the fixtures 1 through 10, except for number 5, and then puts those on at that percentage. Okay, so that is how the accept key works in conjunction with the through key. Now, there's one thing to note about the accept key, and this is the only time where you need to ensure that you uh, understand how the logic of syntax works. Um, if we type, for example, 1 through 20, okay, and now we said we didn't want accept 5, okay, and 10, enter, what you will notice is that hasn't got rid of number 10. You can just see that on my, my output window here, it's still selected. It hasn't got rid of uh, fiction number 10 out of your selection. And that's because the AND and the ACCEPT keys are a bit like kind of plus and minus keys, really. So you need to type, the ex you need to press the ACCEPT button before each number that you don't want. So if we do that again, 1 through 20, ACCEPT for 5, ACCEPT 10, and ACCEPT 15, for example, at 65, enter. Okay, so you can go make those big selections, but you need to be aware that you need to press the accept key before each number and not type accept 5 and 10, for example. The and adds a fixture back into the selection. Um, you can also use accept with the through key. So we could have typed, say, 1 through 20, but I didn't want accept uh, 10 through 14 at 55, enter. Okay, so you can use the through key in conjunction with it, accept, but not the AND key, okay? Treat those a bit like plus and minuses. Great stuff. So, that's how to use the syntax, okay? Um, hopefully all of that is quite self-explanatory, um, so we, we, it's, uh, it's very easy to pick up, uh, and you will notice that by far that is the quickest method of controlling the fixtures on your desk. Now, you may have noticed uh, that I have been pressing a button quite often every time I've started a new command, uh, and that is the clear button. It's probably the button you're going to press the most on the desk. Um, and there is a reason for that, and I just want to go through that now, okay? What you need to understand is everything we are doing here, okay? Everything that you see in the output window, these red values, okay? They are going into what we call the programmer. Now, the programmer is you, essentially, okay? It, it is you. Um, 
And what do I mean by that? So the programmer in our, on our consoles, and most consoles for that matter, always win. Okay? The programmer always wins. Um, it means that if you're controlling a fixture, and you're telling a fixture to do something, it's going to do that regardless of what else you might have programmed on the console, um, what else might be happening on the system, uh, you are in control of that fixture. So we need to clear out the programmer every time we want to allow that fixture to listen to things that we have recorded. Okay, so. To clear out the programmer, you use the clear button. It's a double tap of the clear button, okay, to clear out the programmer. But what does that double tap do? So the first press of clear actually just gets rid of the selection. So this is quite handy to be used when you are building your scene using the syntax. So, for example, I could type, if I start again, I could type 1 through 5 at 65, enter. Okay, and then if I now wanted to just control the fixtures, I could just press the clear button, which gets rid of my selection, and I can go ahead and do some other things on the console without affecting those lights. No matter what I do now, if I did at at, or I did at 95 enter, okay, nothing's going to happen to those fixtures because I've removed the selection, I'm not controlling them anymore, but I've left the intensity in the program. So the first tap of clear just gets rid of the selection. The, the second tap of clear, okay, gets rid of everything else, the intensities, okay? So if I tap that again, you'll notice the intensities uh, remove from that, okay? Great stuff. So, first tap is getting rid of the uh, selection, second tap gets rid of the intensities. Cool. So, that is intensity control. Intensity control is done yeah, a, number of, a number of ways. No way is, is right or wrong. It all depends on what you're trying to do and how you want to operate. Okay, so you can use faders, you could use the select keys with the intensity, um, intensity wheel that I showed you under the Z button. You could use the syntax, okay, and whilst you're using the syntax, you need to be aware of the programmer um, information and how the clear button works with that. So let's go ahead and move on to the final way in control intensities and that is via your groups. Okay. Now I'm just going to pop into setup. Okay. So I'm just going to pop into setup here. I'm just going to do a, uh, a delete uh, of my groups. Okay, there's already groups recorded in here, so I'll just clear all my groups. Tell you what, whilst I'm here, I'm just going to clear everything else uh, so I can show you all from scratch. Great stuff. So, what are your groups? When you press the group button, okay, and that is found just on the right hand side of your syntax, you will be presented with this screen that you are seeing here. Now, again, obviously, as, I'm, as I said at the start of the session, this screen that you're seeing is uh, just an enlarged version of the internal screen that you are seeing on the actual um, image of the console. And this is showing you your groups. Now, by default, there's nothing here. Uh, you don't see anything in this screen when you first turn on the desk, uh, but you are presented with this button in the middle, okay? So this button in the middle says, would you like us to automatically create you some groups? And it's up to you whether you do that or not. It's uh, different in, it, it's useful in different use cases and, and not useful in other use cases. But what the automatically create groups does is the following. If you press that button, we will look at your entire patch within the desk, okay? So we'll look at all the lights that you've got patched in and we are gonna make you five groups for every type of light that you've got patched into your system. So for example, here you can see that we've got five groups for all our ALC4s, okay? And we've got five groups for our, our later washes, K20s, and so on and so on. Uh, these five groups hopefully are self-explanatory with the naming that we give them by default as well. And that is that one of them selects all of those types of light. Uh, one of them selects just the odd fixtures. One of them selects the even fixtures. Uh, one of them selects the first half of the fixtures and the, and the second half of the fixtures. Okay, so some really useful groups here just to get you going 
uh, if you haven't really got much too much time to program especially useful in live events and things like that maybe not so useful in scripted performances where you want to be very specific about which lights you turn on but <clears throat> as I said these can be useful to you but let's go ahead and look how we can make our own groups okay and then how to use them so how do we record a group well first let's check on some lights okay so I'm just going to go ahead, uh, I, I appreciate it's not the most advanced group in the world, but I'm just going to go ahead and type 1 through 10, okay, I'm just going to put that at full by doing the at at shortcut, okay. Now once I've got control of those fixtures and I've turned them on, okay, recording a group is dead simple. As you can see here, there are no empty slots to record our groups to, but as soon as you press the record button, which is on the top left hand side of your syntax, you are then presented with all these empty groups, okay? They all appear when you press the record button. It expands that screen. Uh, you'll notice that a lot across the console. Uh, we don't show you unrecorded information or locations because it just clutters up the screen with useless information, really. Um, but once you press the record button, you are presented with all these different available squares, and you can go ahead and just tap any one of those to record those, uh, to record that group, and you'll notice there that it has given it an automatic name. Now it just so happens to be that one through ten is the selection of all my A Lady Wash K twenties, um, but if it wasn't, it would have given you a name. For example, like uh, just telling you the fixture numbers, it would have said like one through to nine, um, and so on. So it will do its best to give you an automatic name um, to get you going. Um, but if you'd like to rename that yourself, okay, you could actually use the name button on the console. Okay, so you see name, that's the, the kind of two down from record when you press name and then you tap the, uh, tap the group that you just recorded. You would go ahead and give it whatever name you want. Okay, so I, I'll just give this a quick name that I can type on, on with my mouse. So that's how to record a group. Now, numbers to be aware of there, uh, you can record up to 241 groups on the console. Uh, that number will be used quite a lot across the desk. That's our kind of uh, reference number with the amount of faders, uh, the amount of pallets you can have recorded, and so on and so on. Okay. Uh, so you'll hear that number quite a lot, but yes, and groups, you can have 241 groups recorded. Now, how do we use that group? Okay, now that we've recorded that group, how do we use it? So, uh, we can use it in two ways. The first way uh, that you might be more used to if you have used groups in the past is by tapping the group, okay? <clears throat> and you'll notice by tapping the group that makes that selection for me. And then I can use the syntax to say at 85 enter, okay? So, rather than typing one through 10 enter, all I have to do is tap the group and that replaces uh, the first part of my, 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 my free part command to turn on those fixtures. Uh, now, of course, 1 through 10 isn't a hard selection. It probably didn't save too much time in that scenario. But it will save a lot of time, especially when you've got, say, a couple of fixtures dotted all around your rig in various different numbers that you want to bring together to build a scene or to build your front of house wash or whatever you're attempting to do, okay? So, uh, groups can be really, really helpful to save you having to remember all the numbers of the fixtures and so on. And you use it by tapping the group and then typing at an intensity or using at at, for example. Now that's the first way to use groups. The second way to use groups that you may not be as familiar with, depending on what consoles you've used in the past, is actually to use the method of intensity groups. Now, intensity groups, you don't have to do anything else, okay, to actually enable this. It is already enabled by default. And the way in which you do this, okay, is by double tapping the group rather than tapping it once. So if we double tap that group, it actually pushes on those fixtures to 100%. Now, why 100%? Okay, we need to understand why it's pushing it to 100%. Well, when you recorded that group, those fixtures were on at 100%. So when you record, you're not actually just recording the 
the selection of the lights, you're also recording the intensity at which those lights were at. I'll give you some more examples on that. If I actually just selected 1 through 20, enter. So I've selected those lights, but I've not actually given them an intensity. If I record that as a group, okay, uh, you can see here a, a better example of how the automatic name gives you a uh, number of fixtures. If I now double tap that group, that will also go to 100%. So if you record the group at 100%, or you don't record any intensity at all, we will default the, the, the intensity group part of that to 100%. But you can go ahead and define your own intensities when you record your intensity groups. Uh, to do that, you just build your scene like normal. So we could say 1 through 5 at 50, enter. And we can go ahead and record that as a group. Okay. And once I use that one now, it pushes them to 50%, not to 100%. Okay. So you can decide what intensity to, con to uh, put those fixtures at before recording the group and that allows you to use the intensity group side of it as well with your own, your own information. Now as I said you've got the automatic groups that's how to record groups and that's how to use groups. Uh, naming as I said using the name button okay so you could go ahead and tap name tap any group and give it whatever name you want you can also delete a group, okay, if you no longer want to use it. So you can say delete, and then you can tap a group, okay, and that allows you to go and delete. And it gives you a warning, it always gives you a warning on the console. And one thing to note across our desk is that there isn't a, uh, there isn't a back uh, after you've deleted. There isn't like a trash bin or anything. Um, so we always give you a warning uh, prior to allowing you to delete anything. So you can go ahead and say yes or no on that. Okay, but that is groups. That's how to use groups. Okay, um, and that, that's how you record your own groups. Uh, that's how we make the automatic groups and also the intensity groups. Okay, so from here on in, uh, I am not going to tell you um, how to control the intensities of your fixtures or how to turn your fixtures on. If you are following along on your own console or on Phantom Xeros, you can decide which method you want to use. Uh, every single one uh, is there, available for you to use, and it depends what you're trying to achieve. But now we're going to start looking at the toys. Okay, We're going to start looking at how to actually control our fixtures on the console. So let's kick off with that. Uh, to do this, I'm just going to go ahead and turn on uh, the fixtures 1 through 10 again. Um, again, I could have done that with a group, I could have done that with intense, with the faders or the syntax, whichever method you want to use. Now, as I said earlier, the faders on the console are the intensities of those fixtures, and everything else is controlled elsewhere on the desk. And the first thing we're going to look at is the position of those fixtures. Okay, so. You'll see down the right hand side of your console, okay, down the right hand side of your console's internal touch screen, you have all these fixture attribute buttons, okay, so the attributes uh, are broken into categories on the console and, uh, and we allow you to, to use these on the internal touch screen. So let's go ahead and click position and see what we've got here. Once you're in position, you are greeted with this window. Okay, this window presents you with your position palettes. Now, what is a palette? Well, a palette is a bit like a, a bit like a painter's palette, really. It says you can basically just dip that fixture into any one of those palettes, and it's going to go to that that color or that information. In this re in this reference, it would be obviously to that position. Now, we can automatically create you some palettes, and if you click the button. We can make you one, okay? And the only fix, the only position that we can make for those fixtures is what we call the home position. The home position of the fixtures, by default, is straight down or straight up, depending on how you've got those fixtures rigged. So you can see that there, that they're pointing straight down from the from the truss that they're on, um, and that is the home position of those fixtures. Okay, so. The next time you actually select uh, some fixtures uh, after automatically creating, you will see 
that palettes are highlighted if they are available for uh, for those for those uh, fixtures for those fixtures. So we can go ahead and start using these palettes by clicking them. But of course, you're not going to notice any difference there. Okay. We can also go and use the in, um, not the intensity wheels, the position wheels. So this is by far the easiest way to control the position of your lights, and that is by using the pan and the tilt wheels just here. <coughs> what are pan and tilt? Well, pan is the circular rotation of a fixture, and tilt is the up and down road, uh, the up and down movement of the head of the fixture. Okay. So we can go ahead and start by, for example, applying some tilt to our fixtures. You can see that there. And then once I start using the pan wheel, I can then bring those around to the front, for example. And once I put a bit more, a bit more tilt on it, okay, you can see that taking effect there. Okay. So the pan and tilt uh, are used like that. You just, you just circle the wheel around. And once you've got a position that you like or you want to record, uh, you can go ahead, okay, and select to record this as a position palette. Now you do this in the same way that you recorded groups. You press record, and then we present you with all your available position palettes. So we can go ahead and just select that there. Uh, again, if you'd like to name the palette, you can click the name button and click the palette and give it whatever name you want. Okay, so I'll just use the creative name of test again. So using pan and tilt, okay, on the wheels, controls all those fixtures that you've got currently selected. Remember, it's always based on your selection. So if you only have two of those lights selected, it would only be two doing the two of them. Uh, and you can record that as a, uh, as a new palette as well for you to use. So you can see now when I jump between the home and the test palette, uh, how that works. You could also use, uh, on the touch screen, you've got an option for a pan tilt grid. Okay, so the pan tilt grid uh, could take a little bit of getting used to, but can really speed up some of your operation. So here, if we just click dead in the center of the grid, okay, you'll see that the up and down movement, so if I just go up and down the grid, that is equivalent to the tilt, okay? So to do this, you tap on the screen, you just drag your finger up and down the screen. So up and down is equivalent to tilt, and left to right is the equivalent to the pan rotation, the circular rotation. So I can go ahead and actually use this to control my fixtures uh, rather than the pan and tilt wheels. Now, as I said, it takes a little, little bit of getting used to, but once you've found where your lights point, depending on where you go on the grid, um, it, it can really speed up your operation. And once you've got them in a, in a nice position like that, you can go ahead and press the record button again, and that jumps you straight back automatically to your position palette, and you can just go ahead and select the new palette. So you can see that the console's doing a lot of that jumping back and forth for you. Okay, and you can see when we go back here that it's there. And I can jump between these palettes now and this new one as well. <coughs> so that is palettes, the pan tool grid, how to record palettes. Uh, and deleting palettes and naming is all exactly the same as if you were making uh, or utilizing groups. So, that is position. Let's move on to the next feature, uh, which is, uh, let's go to color next, okay? So you'll find color again uh, on the right hand side of your touch screen. So we can go and tap the color button, and this is what you are presented with in the internal screen. On the internal screen, you are seeing, once again, your palettes. Uh, Again, you're going to see a completely blank screen, uh, and we'll, we'll come to the palettes in just a second. Firstly, we will cover the wheels. Uh, so just like on pan and tilt, um, the wheels are one of the simplest and quickest ways uh, when you first in the desk on to control the colour. So I can go ahead and just dial out various colours using these wheels, okay, and that will change the colour of my fixtures using that method, okay. So I just go ahead and move those wheels um, around to do that. You'll see you've got four wheels here and you can kind of get an idea of now of why at the start of the session I said that I personally don't lock the intensity wheel to my first wheel. And that's because when I'm in the attribute of those fixtures it's nicer to be able to see four attributes at one time rather 
than seeing three attributes at one time. Now, so you can see those, you can see those four there, but by default, quite a lot of fixtures these days have more than four options. Uh, especially when we get involved in beam in, in just a second, you'll see lots more options. Um, but for example, in color as well, you might have red, green, blue, white, amber, UV, a color wheel. Okay, it really does depend on what, on what fixtures you've got. So don't worry that you've only got four wheels. Okay, you can basically use the attribute buttons a bit like page buttons as well. So if I go and press color again, it basically cycles those wheels to the second page of color and you can now see that we've got a, a CTO and we also got a color wheel as well, a color one, typically referred to color wheel on our desks. Um, and if I press it again, it'll just go back to the first page. So using these buttons on the side multiple times basically acts it like a page button for, for the wheels. So if you don't see what you think you are wanting to use or you think you've got access to on the wheels, uh, straight away just go ahead and press the button again and you will find those options so uh, that's the wheels okay um, let's have a look at pallets so you again are presented with a button that says would you like us to automatically create you some pallets and you can go ahead and tap that button there and we're going to be able to make you a lot more pallets than we did um, in the previous method uh, in position, okay, because obviously in position we don't know where your lights are rigged, so we can only make you the one, uh, the one pallet. Um, and you can see here that you've got all these various pallets you can use, so I can just go ahead and tap any one of these, and that changes the colour of my lights, nice and simple, okay. So actually, uh, the colour pallets are probably some of the most useful automatic pallets to be used. Um, um, and it will definitely speed up your operation, especially at the start. Okay, you'll see here that some are greyed out. Uh, these ones here, uh, typically, if they if they're not available for a color mix color mixing fixture, uh, they typically refer to more of like a color wheel. So some fixtures have got a color wheel inside, and we will make you some palettes dependent on what fixture you've got patched in. So what pallets you see here are not the ones that you will probably see when you uh, do it on your console because you might have different fixtures. But the, the first kind of 13 color pallets you will see uh, if you are using color mixture fixtures. Okay. Uh, I can go ahead and make my own color my own um, color pallets. So if I just make a, a random color, okay, on on those, on those I'll go for that yellowy color and press record. Again, I will be presented with all these empty pallets, again, 241 locations, and I can just go ahead and select any one of them. Uh, you will then see a painter's stroke put inside the pallet by default. And this, again, is just a way that we try and speed up the operation um, so that you get a better idea of what color that pallet is without having to name the palette. Obviously by default it's just given it the name of the number of the palette that you recorded. Great stuff. So let's move on. Um, if you look across the top of the touch screen you've got a few other options within colour. Okay, The first one that you see here is Picker. Okay, <clears throat> Using the colour picker you can press on the screen Okay, and just drag your finger around and that allows you to change the color of your lights instead of using the wheels. So you can see that actually on the wheels, it is uh, changing the, uh, the RGBW values um, depending on where you are within the color picker. And you can go ahead and select a color within the color picker, press record, the console jumps you back to your palette, a bit like what we were doing earlier with your hand tool grid, uh, select the new palette, and then it'll jump you back. So it does all that kind of jump in between screens for you. And when you go back to your palette, you will see your new palette recorded there. Uh, something else to note within uh, the, the picker view, um, you can also load in your own custom images, okay, into the color picker. So just down the left-hand side here, you can load in your own custom images, um, and you can load those into the desk for you to use as your color picker. Okay, so you could load in a nice picture of the sunset, for example, or you could load in a company logo and you could go and pick colours from that. 
Uh, the other thing to mention about the colour picker is something I can't demonstrate to you, but I can describe, um, and that is the multi-touch fixture, uh, fixture, the multi-touch feature on the desk. Okay, so if you press and hold in one location uh, with your finger, and then press and press on the screen with another finger, okay, you can actually scatter all those colours between those two points of contact across the fixtures that you've got selected. So it's like a multi-touch spreading feature. Now, and the technical term that we use for, for those that, that spreading of those colours is fanning. We fan all those colours between those points of contact across your fixtures. So if you are using uh, the console at home, do have a little play with that to see how that works. Uh, my screen here isn't a touch screen, so I, if I start pressing it, it's probably going to get a little bit unhappy. Um, if we move across to our faders view, our faders are essentially just internal uh, internal uh, touchscreen faders that allow you to go and control the individual colours uh, within the colour mixing um, attributes uh, individually rather than using the wheels. So it's an alternative to the wheels essentially. And it also presents you with the, with the other ways of colour mixing. So you see RGB. You see CMY, so you can see here that when I do RGB at zero, actually CMY is at full, so you can kind of get an understanding of how that is working. And you can also see HSV as well, hue, saturation, and value. They're the three ways that we use for color mixing. Okay, so you can go ahead and use these. Um, these faders have two functions. They have a static mode and they have an active mode. Static is what you're looking at now, and then active it actually now shows you some better, some more useful information. What this shows you is it's now showing you what colour you're going to achieve by increasing that colour. So it, this is still a green fader, but it's now showing you what colour I would achieve with my fixtures if I was to increase the green fader to full. And you can see as I did that, all these other faders changed colour because it's showing you what colour you will achieve by increasing or decreasing that um, that color, okay. So that's how the faders work on the screen. And then finally, you are presented with filters, okay. So filters, <coughs> um, the gel, the filter, whatever you want to call it, um, <coughs> that would have been put in in front of your generic fixtures. <laughs> We've got the libraries of Apollo, Lee, and Roscoe available to you in the desk. Um, but we've also got this other feature called Mood Boards by the Filters. <coughs> Excuse me. Once you click on Mood Boards by the Filters, okay, <coughs> you can go ahead and see all these various moods that we've got available to you. <coughs> this is designed and made by Lee Filters and various other lighting designers. And what they've said is, well, we've taken the, <coughs> the Lee Filters library and we have uh, grouped them into moods we, um, and said these colours work well to create that kind of mood on stage. So, for example, this is, these are the colours that they've said work well to create an excitement scene. Um, and you can also get an idea of how these colours are best used. So it says these are best used for more saturated colours, are best used for backlighting and effect lighting. So you can get some kind of helping hands here to create uh, some moods uh, uh, depending on what you're trying to recreate on stage. Uh, particularly useful uh, for, for those people that aren't familiar with colour mixing and, and how and what colours work well with what scenes. So uh, just a helping hand that you can go and have a little play with and see if that is of any use to yourselves. But that's colour, okay? Colour, okay, is, uh, is given to you in the form of the palette the picker, the faders, and the filters. Okay, so they are the four ways uh, in which we control our colour. Uh, and again, any method is is right, no method is wrong. And you can go ahead and use any one of those at any time. Let's move on now to beam. Okay, let's go and start having a look at our beam functions on the desk. So to have a look at beam, I'm gonna make a new selection. I'm just gonna get rid of everything in the programmer there. And I'm going to go ahead and select uh, 11 through 15, I believe, just to select a few of those fixtures there. Yeah. So these fixtures are mounted on the side on my visualizer. 
Uh, and these are spots, uh, spot moving lights rather than wash moving lights, okay? So it'll just give us a better idea of the beam function. So let's have a click on beam, okay, and see what we're presented with. Well, once again, we are presented with a pretty empty screen with a button in the middle. Would you like us to make you some pallets? So we can go ahead and say yes, please, and we will make you those pallets there. And remember, the next time that you go through and select those fixtures, we are going to highlight those that are available to you and grey out the ones that are not available to you based on your current selection. Okay? And you can also see here that we put in an image into these palettes, okay? a bit like in the colour palette, we put a stroke of the colour. Well, in the beam shape palettes, we put an image of the gobo. If it is available, uh, if we have been provided it, uh, by the fixture manufacturer uh, and it is inside the library. If it's not, uh, you can um, request that from the fixture manufacturer, send it across to us and we will take a look. But by default, you can just go ahead and select any one of these palettes to start using your fixtures. Okay, <coughs> great stuff. Now, in beam is where you're going to be using the um, the beam button the most in terms of using it like a bit like a page button. Okay, so what I mean by that, as I said in color, um, most fixtures these days have got more than four options. Okay, uh, most most fixtures have got more than four options, so you do have to use the button again to act a bit like a page button. Okay. So for beam, for example, you can see here as I keep continuously pressing beam. I'm being presented with tons of options within. So I've actually got like four or five pages of wheels, essentially, that I can go and access. Um, I'm not going to go through each one individually, okay, because every single fixture you use will typically have different functions. Uh, some will have two gobo wheels, some will have one, some will have a, a shutter, some will have a physical strobe, uh, some will have an iris, some will have a zoom, some won't. So you just need to go and have a little play around in Beam to see what is available to you uh, and just have a little play around with, with what you've got. But there is one or two other things that I do want to mention <coughs> that will help you when you are playing around inside the Beam functions. Uh, as I said, we make you these automatic palettes for the Gobos, okay? But what's also quite useful is each wheel, okay, has got a button inside the wheel. So you can see on your console four wheels, and each wheel has got a button in the middle. If you was to press the button, okay, of any channel, if that channel has got information within the within that channel that we can expand and present to you, we will do so. Okay, so for example. You can see here that I've pressed the middle button of uh, Gobo, number, Gobo Wheel 2, uh, and we can see here the Gobo that we can go and put in. Okay, So pressing the middle button is very useful uh, just to give you a better idea of what's going on, rather than just endlessly cycling the wheel until you find what you want. Now, if you were to press the middle button of a, func of a, um, of a channel that doesn't have any functions, uh, let's have a look at Zoom, for example. Okay, yep, so Zoom doesn't have any information to, to show you. It is just a wheel to, to zoom the fixture, bigger or smaller. Then press in the middle and does absolutely nothing. Okay, so you, can, you don't have to worry about that. Um, it does nothing at all. So go and have a little play in here. Uh, recording palettes, is, I, it, it works in exactly the same way. So, for example, if I go and uh, change the focus of those fixtures and change a bit of the frost in it as well, and I want that as a, as a palette that I'm going to come back to time and time again, I can press record and choose that as a, as a new beam shape palette. Okay, and again, I can go and name that palette as well and give it whatever name I want. So, that is beam. Now, as I said, I'm not going to go for everything, every single function. I want you guys to, um, to have a little play around with that yourselves, okay? Um, so have a little play in there uh, and see what functions you've got just by pressing the beam button a few times. Okay, great stuff. Let's move on to the final function on the right hand side that we're going to cover, which is the effect button. The effect key, okay, presents you with this screen here. 
And this screen is, is by far the most useful screen to, to create automatic palettes. So again, you are presented with an empty screen. Would you like us to make you some? Yes, please. And you are presented with the following. Now, for this demonstration, I'm going to go back to my 1 through 10 that I've got at the back of the stage, just to give you a better idea of what's going on. Uh, and I'm going to pop them in a, the position I had, which was pointing them towards the front, okay? Just so you've got a, uh, a better idea of, of how these are being used. I'll just tilt those back down a bit. Great stuff. So once you're in effect, these are uh, the parts that you are seeing. What is an effect? Well, it, let's go and click figure of eight. That is what an effect is. Now, I, I will apologize in advance if there's any uh, jumpiness uh, on, on your side, uh, obviously all based on internet connections whilst we're live streaming. But this would create a nice, smooth figure of eight because that's the, that's the fixture, that's the palette that I pressed. It would select a nice, smooth effect to run across your fixtures. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of what an effect is now. An effect is a predefined bias, predefined kind of effect to apply to your fixtures. And that can be both movement, it can be color, it can be uh, beam shape. Uh, and we'll have a little look down here now and see what we've got available to us. If at any point you just want to stop your effect, okay, you can just press no effect, which is the first palette, and it will get you back to, um, to, to doing nothing. And we can go ahead now and select another one. So let's say, for example, uh, a vertical line. Okay, and that just starts tipping them in, in and out. I can layer effects on top of one another. So as I scroll down, you can see that there are some color effects here. And you can actually get a better idea of how these are referenced by these letters that you see next to the numbers. So for example, uh, you see um, with figure of eight, okay, um, you see that with the movement effects, that you see P and E. That means it's a position effect. Okay. You see with rainbow, CE, that's a color effect. So I can apply a color effect on top of my position effect. Okay, and I can get that happening like that. So you can see very quickly how I can build some pretty good lighting states um, and effects uh, using what's inside the console. Um, now, how do we control these effects? Well, you've got a few options across the top of the LCD, okay, the internal touchscreen. Uh, you've got some offset options. So let's just go ahead and set no offset, okay, and you can see what that does. So by default, we do apply offset to the effect. This allows you to, well, this, this basically again just speeds up the process, because typically you're going to put offset across them depending on what you want to achieve. So again, I can say forward offset, Okay, and you can get an idea of how that's running up the chain now um, across your fixtures rather than um, going backwards. So I can click backwards offset and now it's running down my chain. So it's basically just starting each fixture slightly behind or slightly in front of the other. Or I could just go ahead and just select random offset. Okay, and it, that is what it is. All right. Um, I've also got an offset wheel down the bottom. Uh, just be aware that if you use the offset wheel on its own, it's actually changing the offset for all the fixtures to be the same, which in turn basically means that they haven't got any offset from one another. Um, and actually you need to use the fanning uh, ability um, to do that. Uh, fanning on the console, okay. Um, fanning on the console is holding down the shift and using any wheel, okay. And that will start to apply a fan and you can see how that works there. It's now applied an offset across those fixtures um, instead of applying the same offset to all those fixtures. We're not going to um, go into too much detail um, about fanning on the entry level uh, of this course, um, but do let us know in the comments and so on if you've got any questions. Um, let's go ahead and look at the other wheels. So you've got some other wheels available to you, spy, uh, spy, speed and size. Okay. Uh, speed and size, hopefully quite self-explanatory what they do. Um, speed will obviously speed up or slow down that intensity so I can pretty much stop it by going down to that number there. And the size will increase the size that it needs to go over um, depending on what you're trying to do. So for example there you can, you can see that changing. So have a little play around with effects. There are tons of effects inside, uh, inside here. Okay. Um, that you can go have a little play around with. You'll also see lately, uh, depending on the version of software that you are running, that we've included some new effects within, um, 
within our effects window. So these are more aimed and designed at theatrical, um, theatrical type effects. So you've got things like fire and, and warning lights and, and candle flickers and stuff like that. Okay, so how it'll play with, um, with that. Great stuff. Okay. Cool. Let's move on. So we are going to have a look at now how to record. Okay. We have shown you all the various ways in which you can control your fixtures. Okay. Um, showing you all the different ways in which you can control your fixtures. And now we need to go and have the ability to control them. So let's go ahead and take a look how to start recording. I've just got a question popping in there. Um, how can we control the speed of a figure of eight movement? Uh, how can you control the speed of a figure of eight movement with a fader? Ah, great stuff. So, uh, so we've actually got a function um, that we call speed override. We can actually apply a speed override. Uh, sorry, we can assign a playback fader to be a speed override function. Uh, we're not going to go into too much depth with that in a minute. However, tomorrow there is actually a live stream dedicated all to effects and chases. And we're going to go into a lot of detail on how to do those kind of things there. Whereas this is obviously a bit more of the entry level side of it. Um, so if you do want to pop over along to the stream tomorrow, um, that will give you all the information you're looking for. Um, and it will go into detail about speed override and, and that kind of stuff as well. So hopefully that answers your question, Dan, from Facebook. Um, great stuff. Let's move on to, con um, to programming. So, for the process here, okay, I just want to show you uh, what your external screen is going to look like. Okay, so up until now, I've only been showing you your internal touch screen. Um, but for for this process, I want to have a show you what the um, what the external screen looks like. Okay, so I'm just going to pop that up here. Okay, just so you get an idea of how that looks, and then. We're going to start using the internal touchscreen to actually be our touchscreen now, rather than um, rather than using the external as, as a as a as a wider view. Um, so this is your external monitor here. Okay, um, your external monitor shows you your um, your fixture overview, uh, your fixture output window at the top, and then it shows you your playback view at the bottom. Okay. Uh, there are some other options at the bottom of your external monitor. Uh, you've got um, this view here is your cues view. You have a fader view where it shows you your fixtures and your faders. You've got a palette view, color, beam, position, and effect. And you've also got groups, color, and a color window. You might think that this is a duplicate, but actually this allows you to have different ways of color mixing presented to you uh, at the same time. But we're going to go ahead and just stay within our cues, um, cues window there. Okay. And let's have a look at what's going on. So let's record some cues. We can start by recording cues by turning some lights on. So I'm just going to turn on one through ten. Oh, it's my default go-to whenever I'm using the desk. Um, one through ten. Okay, turn those on at full. I'm going to go and uh, apply some colour to this. Okay, so I'm just using my my internal screen here. Uh, just go and apply say red, and I'm going to go ahead and put some position here, so I'll put them in this, this position. Okay, and then I'm going to record. So how do we record a cue? Well, the first part is done. The first part I've been talking about for the last 59 minutes, to be exact. It's how to control your fixtures and how to set them up. Okay, um, so you've got all the different ways now in, in how to control your fixtures. Uh, so once you've built the look that you want, okay, once you've built the scene that you want, you can go ahead and press the record button. When you press record, okay, everything on the console will start flashing at you. Everything on the desk can start flashing. What does this mean? Anything that is flashing means that it's empty. It's got the ability to be recorded onto, okay? So you can see here that all our playback faders are flashing. You can see that our master playback is flashing. You've got some UDKs here. We'll cover those later. Um, so I can go ahead and choose to record to any of these. Now, for the process of this demonstration, uh, we are going to be recording onto the master playback because I'm showing you a bit more like a theatrical type cue list. 
So I've pressed the call button and then I'm just going to go and press the go button, the, the play button, the master playback button. Okay. And once I've done that, okay, that's basically said record it to that location. You can now see within our cues view, because I'm looking at the master playback, you can see here that I've now got cue number one inside that stack. Okay, so that's how to record a cue, nice and simple. Let's go ahead and record some more cues. So I'm going to turn those fixtures off now. Uh, I'll, I'll turn them off, okay, and I'll put some other fixtures 11 through 15. Okay, and I'm going to go and apply a gobo into them, for example. And I'll just change the position of them a little bit. Okay, point them back. I'm going to record again. And this time you'll notice that the play button isn't flashing at you. Now, it's not flashing at you because it's already got something recorded. Um, however, you can just press it again. Record, tap that button, and now it records cue number two. Okay, so we're always going to just keep recording the next available queue for you. Uh, so we can go ahead and turn those off. Uh, I'm just going to go back again, record queue number three. I'm going to record those fixtures on, uh, and I'm going to put those in a different position. Again, I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win any kind of awards for my uh, my lighting designs today. <laughs> I'm just putting those in a different position, different colour. Press record and choose there. Okay, great stuff. So that is how to record some cues. I have got three cues recorded into my cue list and I can go ahead and start to use them. So how do we use our cues? First things first, as I said quite early on in the session about the programmer, you need to go and clear the programmer to allow you to use all those fixtures with the cues that you just recorded. So to clear the program information, double tap clear and you're ready to go. Great stuff. So, highlight the queue that you want to go to. You can either move up and down with the arrow keys, okay, on the console, uh, or you can go ahead and use the touch screen if it is external, or um, and so on to, to select the queue that you want to go to. So I'm going to select number one and then press go, okay. And here we go with queue number one. Now, queue number one is obviously the start of our show, so don't worry about the movements and so on. Um, because it's always the start, it's kind of typically when your audience are already inside the venue. Um, and that is how you, you, you use a queue. And we can go ahead and press go again, and that then fades into queue number two. And we can go ahead again and fade into queue number three. Okay? So that is how to cycle through your queue list, okay? You use the go button and you notice that it just goes down in order. Okay, nice and simple. You'll notice uh, when we started off, we only had one color bar. We were just moving around with this, uh, this orange bar here. But now as soon as we hit the go button, we've got two bars, one that's green, one that's orange. Uh, so the green one is showing you the color, uh, sorry, the green one is showing you the, um, the queue that's currently live on stage and the orange one is showing you the queue that you're gonna go to next. Okay, so hopefully that, uh, that legend makes sense there. Great stuff. So let's have a look at what else we can do with our cues. So the first thing we need to look at, by far the most common thing, is how to update our cues. Okay, uh, you recall an entire show and now we need to go and make some changes. So let's go ahead and do that. I've got cue number one live and outputting on the stage. I'm going to go ahead and select those fixtures. Okay. Um, at this point, I want to introduce you to one other handy shortcut that we've got on the desk, and that is um, the double enter press, okay? Um, quite often, it's not going to be as simple as having one through ten on. Uh, if, you've got a, if you've got an entire scene, you're going to have tons of various lights on, uh, all different numbers scattered across your rig, and you might want to just go and select all your lights that are currently outputting so that you can make some changes. So if you double tap the enter button at any time, okay, it will select all lights that have currently got an intensity. Okay, so that's just a, a handy little shortcut uh, to allow you to do that. Once I've got control of the fixtures I want to make a change to, I'm just going to make the change of colour within this one. So I'm going to change the colour so it's very obvious uh, with the update. Okay, 
And then once I've made all the changes, go and press the update button. So this is underneath the record button, okay? So I can press update and then press the master playback because that's where the queue is that I want to update. And you will notice the load bar pop up there and there we go, we've made the changes. So now when we cycle through our queues, there's queue number two, here's queue number three, okay? And when I go back to queue number one, you'll notice it's no longer in its red that it was when I first recorded the queue. It's now in that uh, bright green colour. Okay, so that is how you go and make updates to your queues. If you'd like to copy queues, um, copying queues is, is very, very straightforward. You have a copy button at the bottom of the console. Press that, and when you are in the queue window, it shows you uh, that you want to copy queues. And you can go ahead and say from queue number one to queue number five, and then press OK. And there we go, we've copied that queue. And we copy everything about it. So if that queue had a name, or if it had different fade times, or any of that kind of stuff, which we'll go through in a minute, we will have copied everything, okay, about that queue. So that, that, that's copying, it's nice and nice and simple. Uh, let's have a look now, okay, at our queue window. Okay, so I've shown you how to navigate around it by tapping into the various queues. Um, I've shown you how to play with it uh, using the, the go button. Obviously, you can use the touch screen to navigate or the arrow keys. But you've also got all these different columns available to you across the, the screen. So, what are they? So, well, let's treat this a little bit like an Excel spreadsheet. It, it's not, um, but treat it a bit like an Excel spreadsheet just so you get an idea of, of the format of how this is laid out. And each row is a queue and each column is settings that you can provide or, or notes that you can provide to that queue. So let's talk about the first one, the queue number, okay? And um, this is assigned by us. You can't change what is inside this column, okay? So we will always give this uh, an automatic number uh, because you're recording the next available queue. Every time you press record, you are recording the next number. If you'd like to actually dictate which queue that you record, uh, you don't do that here. You do it obviously in the recording process. Uh, so, for example, I could type record 101 and then choose the master playback, and that's how I can dictate which queue I record to that location. Now, what you can do within here, okay, is you can double tap into any one of these cells, and you can see that provides me with the cursor, okay, allows me to go and make some, uh, some changes. And I'm just going to go ahead and type 101, okay, and then press enter. And that jumps me down to that queue, okay? So it doesn't change the queue number of queue number one. It doesn't alter anything. It doesn't copy queues. It doesn't, doesn't do anything at all other than it jumps you down the list. And that is really useful if you've got a massive queue list. Um, you don't want to be scrolling on a touch screen or pressing the down arrow loads of times. You can use the, um, use the number instead to uh, select um, which queue you want to jump down to. So again, I could jump back up to queue number one, for example. Okay? Now, uh, the example there using uh, the five queues that I've got isn't a great example, but if you had 200 queues in your show, that is a very, very nice way of jumping around your, your queue stack. Great stuff. Let's move across to name. Okay. Hopefully, name should be one of the most self-explanatory columns. Okay. Um, you can go ahead and double tap into any one of these and give it whatever name you want. Okay. And that will appear in the name box. Uh, treat it like a, a a a comments box, or you could say when Bob walks on stage, or um, just tell me what the queue is. Use whatever you use it for whatever you wish. Um, you can also use the name button, okay, so if you prefer a more syntax based entry, you could say name two and then press the play button and that is saying name Q number two of this location and again I can go and type in and it appears there, okay. 
Great stuff. So let's have a look at the next columns, which is our fade times. So our fade times, we're going to cover this in one big section. Uh, you've got a fade up, a fade down, a color fade, a beam shape fade, and a position fade. Okay, so every attribute has got a different fade time applied to it. Let's have a look at the normal fade up and fade down first. Uh, so fade up and fade down only affects intensities. Okay, so that's why we've given you these separate fade times for the other attributes. Up and down is only for intensities of those fixtures. Um, we can go ahead and tap into, say, the fade up of Q number two. And what you can uh, see uh, a little bit on the wheels, I'll just move this screen out the way. Okay, I'll pop that over here for now. But what you can see on the wheels is that actually we provide you with the fade times on the wheels. So, on the wheels, you're presented with four options. You're presented with the fade, the up delay, the down fade, and the down delay. Now, you'll notice that the first wheel is just called fade and not up fade. Okay? Something to note uh, when you're using the desk, uh, and again, just to speed up operation. If I go ahead and move that wheel, okay, for the fade time, you'll notice it actually moves the up and the down time together. Now, the reason for that is quite typically, not all the time, of course, but typically if you just want a, um, a, a perfect crossfade uh, between scenes, you obviously need the same fade up and the same fade down. Um, so it's just been an operation for you um, so that we apply the same fade time to both both parts. But if you want to split out the fade times, as soon as you use the down fade, okay, it then instantly renames that so that it is now just an up fade. And it will wait uh, and it will stay there to be a fade time, okay, and it allow you to use both of them individually. You've also got the delay times, okay, hopefully these are quite self-explanatory. You can put a delay so that when you hit go on the queue it actually waits X amount of time until it does something. Um, other ways in which you can change the fade times, uh, you could press the middle button of the wheel and we actually apply, uh, we give you a, a, a keypad to type into on the touchscreen. Okay. Um, alternatively, you can double tap into any of the cells and use the syntax okay, to, or external keyboard or whatever you've got um, to type as well. Okay. So that's how the fade times work on the desk. Um, if you would like to define the fade times at the point of recording, this is skirting a little bit into more advanced stuff rather than entry level, but I did want to just mention it. Um, if you'd like to define the fade times at the point of recording the queue, when you press record, you'll actually notice that these fade wheels are presented to you. So you could actually go, whilst you've got the recording process uh, happening, okay, you could go ahead and change the fade times using the wheels and then record that to the master playback and granted there's nothing there because I didn't change any fixtures but that's what would be applied okay so you would see those you would see those fade times inside there great stuff so let's have a look at you also got color beam and position fade okay obviously tapping on any one of those presents it to you on the wheels uh, and also allows you to type into it just the same way as the colour fit and the fade up and fade down. Um, and by default, we will apply three seconds to everything except the beam shape. Beam shape will be defaulted to zero seconds. Um, this is because typically you want your gobo wheel to get there as quick as it can rather than slowly staggering through each gobo you've got available. Um, so you can go ahead and change any one of these, but we will give it three seconds as default. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a few missing fade times, and that is because we don't present you stuff that isn't there. Uh, so, for example, in Q101, this implies that Q101 is exactly the same as Q5, because there is nothing changing between those two queues, so there is no reason for any fade times. Um, but if I had made changes to the lights between those queues, then you would see fade times presented. Same in here, there's no beam shape to change, so we don't present it to you. Okay, so that's why you see some empty bits as well as some populated bits. Great stuff. 
Let's have a look at uh, a few other options within our queue list window. Um, we've got some other options here within the last column called queue settings. So I'm going to go ahead and press the queue settings button of queue number three. Okay. Once I'm in queue number three, okay, I am presented with this window, this pop-up. And what are we actually seeing here? So we are seeing an option for the trigger of that queue. Okay, so the trigger of that queue. And what is a trigger? Well, a trigger is how do you want that queue to happen? Um, when, when is that queue going to happen? And by default, it's set to go. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? it it's set to go because it's going to happen when you physically press the go button on that queue. But there are other things that you can do within the trigger option. So you can drop this down. And remember, we're with queue number three, so we're only changing the trigger option of queue number three. You've got some autos, okay, which we'll cover in just a second. You've also got a real time and a MIDI. So we'll just mention real time first. Uh, real time is quite literally a time of the day, okay? So you can have this queue happen at, for example, uh, 7 p.m. in the evening. Uh, one thing to note is to ensure that the time uh, and date and everything is correct on your desk, uh, and that is done within the setup window. Uh, setup, uh, and then go and change the time. And providing it's correct, we will get that queue to happen uh, at that particular time of day. Uh, you could also use the MIDI function, okay, so if we're going to select that, you can also now see some time code here. Uh, we're not going to go in depth on MIDI, and actually there's not much to learn about MIDI from our point of view. It's more about learning how the other piece of equipment, so what MIDI allows you to do is use a, another piece of equipment to trigger the lighting console. You might do this, for example, if you wanted to trigger the lighting desk, some AV, uh, and maybe some uh, some sound scenes from a digital sound desk, um, all at the same time via a central controller. Uh, so um, most of the learning of MIDI and how that works is done on the the other side of the equation. Uh, and once you've learned that, essentially you have to put in time code, and we have to listen for that time code, and that's where you go and type it in. Okay. But if you've got any questions on MIDI, do feel free to ask. Uh, but most of the learning of MIDI is done on the the other side of the equation rather than uh, rather than on our side. Um, but let's have a look at the autos, okay? What do these mean? So we can actually get Q3 to happen automatically. Uh, we can happen, have it happen automatically with the previous Q, so with, pre with Q number two, or after Q number two, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and select after. That's personally how what I typically use when I'm doing my events. And uh, you'll then be presented with this new box here. This box shows you the wait time, okay? Now, this means that Q3 is going to happen automatically after Q number two, but it's going to wait, and I'm going to choose for it to wait for 10 seconds, okay? And when I press OK on all this, uh, we are now going to see here auto-A10, and that means auto after the previous Q, after 10 seconds. So let's go and play that back and see that happening. I hit go on key number one. Okay, you can see the fade times happening here, these bars moving left to right. And I hit go on key number two. The fade time happens for key number two. Okay, we applied that there. And once that finishes, we then start counting down. So you can see here, we count down from 10 to zero. And that is the wait time that we applied. Okay, and once that hit the zero, which is now, we can go and see Q number three happening automatically. Okay, so that's that's how it works. You can have cues happen automatically after one another and apply wait times to them. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Great stuff. Um, there was a few options that we saw within uh, within these windows. Okay, that I want to go over now, and it's just a quick demonstration I want to go through. Um, and this is a function called move on dark. What is move on dark? Uh, move on dark is by far one of the best features that I personally enjoy uh, having across most consoles, um, not just ours, uh, across most desks you use, you'll find a, a move on dark feature of some description. 
Um, and I'm just going to demonstrate that to you now. So I'm just going to go ahead and press delete uh, and I'm going to delete my entire Q stack. Okay, so you can see that here. I can actually delete, delete my entire Q stack. I'm going to click yes on that. And uh, just for this demonstration, I'm going to turn up, um, I'm going to just close down my, um, my, my external screen in a minute. I'm just going to use my internal. Uh, sorry, just move that to a size so you can see this. I'm just going to use this one light. Okay, I'm going to pop this on. I'm going to put this in a position. And I'm going to record that to the master Q stack. I'm then going to turn that light off. I'm going to turn some other lights on. Okay, and I'm going to change the color of these. And then I'm going to record that onto my master Q stack. And then I'm going to turn the first light back on. I'm going to put it in green, for example. And I'm going to put it in a completely different position. Okay, so I'm going to point it towards the back of the stage there. And record that onto my master playback. Great stuff. So as I said, I'm not going to win awards today for my lighting designs by any stretch of the matter. But I do want to demonstrate something to you. So I'm going to pop my external screen down here. Okay just so you can see what is happening. Um, so what we can see here, okay, is uh, your queue list. So if we just go and have a look at your queue list, we've got queue number one, queue number two, and queue number three, okay? If we go ahead and hit go on queue number one, okay, that applies uh, that queue to that fixture, okay? So it's going on queue number one. And obviously you have a fade time, you saw the movement of the fixture and everything because we don't apply fade times or any move on dark functions to queue number one because typically that queue uh, is before your audience even walks into the venue. Once you've got that, we can now start to demonstrate on what move on dark actually does. So for this demonstration, I am going to go and select this fixture. Okay. The reason I'm doing that is because we're integrating with capture over a, a protocol we can actually see an outline and highlighted outline of that fixture, uh, which would be great if it happened in real life as well, but of course it doesn't. So uh, I just want you to be able to see it because it is going to turn off, uh, but I still want you to see what it's doing. So when we hit go now on queue number two, remember I told that light to turn off. So that fixture is going to turn off, it's going to wait, and then it's going to move. And that is moving on dark, okay? And that is what move on dark is. So when I hit go on queue number three now, it is already in the new position waiting for me. Okay? And that's what Move On Dark is. Move On Dark is a completely automatic process. You haven't got to worry about Move On Dark whatsoever if you don't want to, but there are some things that we can teach you about it and some of the settings to give you a bit more control. Okay? Um, let's go ahead and go into the, the playback settings. Okay, now we haven't shown you the playback settings yet, uh, but now we're going to. To get into the settings of your playback, your, your master playback, you can go ahead and hold down the setup button that is just here on the left hand side of your touchscreen and tap the go button. And once you are inside these playback settings, this is the screen you are presented with. Again, remember I'm showing you your external screen and your internal screen at the same time. Um, there are quite a lot of options inside playback settings that we're actually going to cover today. As I said, this is a this is an entry level course. This is designed to get you going, um, and we're not going to go through all the options today. So do uh, don't worry if there's things that we don't cover. Um, we are more than happy to go through those if you post your questions on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and so on, or we go through those at a later stage. But the one thing I do want to cover within these playback settings is your Move on Dark. Move on Dark, okay, can be enabled or disabled here per playback. So you've actually got these settings per playback. Remember, you've got 241 playbacks across the desk. Um, and each playback can have a full queue stack on it if you wanted to. Um, and you can go and have each, each playback has got its own individual settings. So you can go ahead and disable or enable Move on Dark. By default, is it enabled? I don't typically disable it, especially when I'm doing a more theatrical type show. Uh, I can move to the first queue. Um, again, as I said, the first queue is typically when you are already got your audience uh, before your audience are in. So we just leave that as disabled by default. You can go and enable that if you wanted to. 
Uh, and then we've got these options for don't move. So we move on dark is very easy to see and explain when it comes to position, but actually move on dark affects color and beam shape as well. And um, whilst that fixture is off, especially if you take, for example, a, um, a spot fixture that's got like gober wheels inside, uh, we will move all the wheels inside to get them into the new positions uh, ready for the gobos that you're going to use or the zoom you're going to use or whatever. Okay, so we're going to get absolutely everything ready for that fixture. The only thing we're not going to do is turn that fixture on. That's the only thing we're not going to do. So you can see here that all these are enabled, but the only thing that's disabled is effect. Now we disable this because if for say in queue number one your light is off, but in queue number two your lights are doing a figure of eight, in queue number one, if effect was enabled to allow move on dark, it would now start whizzing around doing a figure of eight, but in darkness. And that might distract, it might cause distraction on stage, it might draw the audience's attention to moving lights that are spinning around. Uh, it might also be a bit noisy, depending on what fixtures you've got. Okay, So actually, we, we disable that by default, but you can go and enable it if you wanted to. The most important things about Move On Dark are the fade time and the delay time that you see here on the right hand side. Uh, fade time, as, I, as you know with fade times, this is uh, a, a kind of easy thing to get on board with now. Fade time is the, the time it takes for that light to move. Now, one thing to understand is uh, it, the movement of the fixture whilst in dark uh, doesn't have any, um, any reference to the position fade times and everything in your cue list it has a reference to this, okay? So we can choose for that to take three seconds by default, or zero seconds, or 20 seconds. Um, but the reason fade time is useful is actually to dampen noise again and, and reduce distraction. Uh, for example, um, let's say you are doing a, a ballet, okay? Um, you're doing a ballet and you have got 20 moving lights in the, in the roof, and you turn them all off, um, because all you've got is your generics on, or you've got a follow spot on the soloist on stage, doing a dance. Um, all your fixtures have gone off and they are now going to move into a new position. Well, that ballet can typically be quite, quite quiet at times. And if you've got a really quiet scene, but then you have 20 moving lights or snap to their new position, that could create quite a lot of motor noise dependent on the fixture you've got, of course. The newer fixtures might be so quiet, it doesn't matter. But the older fixtures especially, uh, or bigger fixtures, uh, might create too much noise. So having a fade time just dampens the noise down so it's not so obvious. And it also, dis again, removes that distraction. So if the audience member can actually see the light, it, uh, it doesn't pull their attention away to it whilst it's moving. Uh, it's more subtle movements, so you don't notice it. And delay time, okay, that, this is the most important one. Delay time is how long you want the light to wait after going dark before it starts fading into its new position. And the reason this is most important is actually because if you had a snap off fade time in your queue, if you had a zero second fade time in your queue list, Electronically, and in, in, in electronics and in software, zero is a dead zero. It, it almost doesn't exist. It's instant, okay? Um, but again, motors and uh, LEDs and various different fixtures will snap off as quick as the technology allows it to. But sometimes it may not be instant. It might not be as instant as software is. So... Uh, we apply a delay time so that you don't see that fixture instantly moving whilst it's still turning off. Okay, so just be aware of those there. So as I said, hold down the setup and go into your playback settings allow you to find these options and change them. Um, you also have some of those options within the queue settings of each queue. So for example, queue number two, go into the settings window, you see the same don't move command per queue. So you can disable or enable the move in of each attribute on a Q stack level and a Q level. Okay, so uh, depending on what you want to do, uh, depending on what you want to do there. Great stuff. So that is typically everything that we're going to go through for for playbacks. Okay, that's how to record playback. 
uh, with a Q-Stack on it. Uh, as we said earlier on, uh, there is a session live streaming tomorrow. There are other things that you can do on playbacks, one of those being a chase that we haven't really gone into depth with, uh, or we haven't covered at all. Uh, and that will be covered in depth tomorrow um, on our chases and effects stream. Uh, I believe that's happening at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning UK time. Uh, but as with all these streams, they're available after that anyway, so you can catch up on them when you've got time or in, in, in the future if you need reminding. Uh, there's one last thing I want to cover in terms of programming uh, okay, that you, um, that you can do on the desk, and that is these four buttons here that we've spent no time covering at all. These are uh, UDKs, okay? User Definable Keys is what these stand for, UDKs. And you can use these in a few different functions. Uh, the most basic function, and, and typically the function I used in, in, in the most, if I'm just going to go and close my external screen, uh, if I just turn on 1 through 10, okay, like so, I'm going to pretend that these are my house lights. They're clearly not, but I'm going to pretend they're my house lights. And I'm going to record that onto uh, this UDK here. Recording process doesn't change. Tap record, choose an empty UDK. And we can now clear out the programmer and use this like a flash key, okay? So the reason I said I'm gonna pretend these are my house lights, okay, is that you can change how these buttons work. So by default, it's a flash key. So I could have this like a strobe or uh, blinders and so on. But for things like house lights that I might wanna put up here or smoke machines or haze machines and, and various other things, uh, if you hold down setup and press the button that you recorded, you are presented with this window here. Uh, you can change the flash mode to latch, okay? And this now changes it a bit more like a light switch. You press it once for on, once for off, okay? Um, we'll look at now, say, fade times, for example. So I'll apply a three second fade time here, okay? And I'll apply a three second fade time here. I don't have to worry about color beam or position because none of that's happening. And now when I press this button here, it fades those lights on over three seconds um, so that you can use them, uh, you can use it a bit more like a scene. I quite often use these for house lights. You just keep them out of the way of my faders because I use my faders for other things. I quite often use these as house lights um, and I can use that function as, as so. As I said, as flash keys, they might be a bit more useful as a blinder, for example, for your show. Um, but what is most useful about the UDKs is ones that are empty. If you hold down setup and press a UDK that has nothing on it, you are presented with this screen here. And if you drop down the function drop down, you are presented with these options. Now, I'm not going to go through every single one of these individually, but if you know what they are, uh, if you have them on other consoles or you've been looking for them, then you will know why you want them. Uh, our syntax is obviously more of a keypad, more of a number pad with a few uh, options around it. Uh, some syntaxes are smaller, some, some, some syntaxes are bigger. Uh, on some consoles you will find, for example, park buttons or unpark or highlight um, as physical keys on the console. Every console is different. Um, so for those buttons that you don't have physically on the desk, if these are ones that you want to go and use, uh, we allow you to assign them to UDKs. So for example, I could assign this as park, and then I could assign the shifted function to unpark. So each UDK has got two functions, a normal press and a shifted press. Okay, and uh, remember the shift, uh, notice the shift key is just down here on the left hand side. Okay, so you can actually use UDKs as an extension to your syntax if you wanted to. Okay, great stuff. So guys, um, that is most things that we are going to cover during this session. We are going to pop into setup in just a second. There are a few things that I want to show you within setup, but not, not too much, but a few things I do want to cover. Um, so whilst I'm going to be going into setup, if you have been following along uh, for the entire session, well done and thank you. Uh, but do pop any questions you might have into the various 
chats across the, the various streams, okay? Um, but whilst, uh, whilst you might be thinking of any questions you have, um, we're going to pop into the setup window. Uh, to show you setup, okay, I'm going to bring back my uh, external monitor, okay, because it just shows it in a, in a bigger view, and I'm going to make it full screen here, um, again, just so you can get a better idea of what is going on. Um, and here is what you are presented with when you go into the setup window. As I said at the start of this session, um, there was an assumed knowledge of patching, okay, and this is what you would have created if you have, if we were patching the console at the start of the session. Um, this is your fixture schedule, it's showing you all the lights that you've got patched into the desk, it's showing you the name of those, what profile they are, uh, the DMX address of those fixtures, and we can go in here and make various changes to them, okay, but again, all this is covered within our getting your console ready to control session. Um, so do go back through uh, the social media stream and have a look at that if you want to go through this in depth. We're not going to be covering patching today. Um, some functions I do want to quickly cover with you though are more the kind of basic functions within setup. Uh, firstly, save. Okay. Um, if you click on save, okay, there's a few things to mention about the desk. Uh, the desk doesn't save multiple files inside the desk. Okay, so what that means is what you're working on, the show that you've been recording, uh, the patching, all the palettes, the cues, and all that kind of stuff, is recorded within the console. Uh, so if you turned off the console, it, it will appear again tomorrow when you turn it back on. But we don't allow you to record multiple files to the desk. If you want to work on a new show now and remove the old show, you would have to start, uh, start fresh. And we ask you to recall, uh, we ask you to save these files to USB. The reason we do this uh, is for one, one main reason we do this is to, to practice very, very good backup of your files. Um, if the worst was to happen, and you see here that I've probably been a little bit carelessly drinking my water around, uh, around my, my equipment, if you were having a drink around your equipment and you spilled it on the desk or or something happened okay during transport uh, you could take your your show file that you have saved to USB and you could go and get another flex or flex s or whatever uh, and load that into the console and it will basically be like using your own desk so always always have a backup of your show file just in case uh, we can't stress that enough um, and to save your show you do so as requested uh, as, as shown here and um, you can give it a file name, okay, so you can go and give your show a name. You can choose where you save that. So typically, obviously, you'll see a local drive here, and that's because I'm running Phantom Zeros on my computer. But you would see your USB drive here that you've got plugged into the desk. Uh, you can choose to save uh, various different files. So you can choose to save it as a Zeros file, which is what it would be by default. Uh, Zeros is the name of our software. Um, or a CSV, quite useful for uh, education if you are exporting a, um, a spreadsheet of the queues and the lights that you've got recorded into each queues. Very good for submitting projects or submitting uh, things to lighting designers, okay, submitting that kind of stuff. Uh, you can export as a CSV and you can save various parts of your show file. You can save the entire show, you can save just the setup options, or you can save setup and the palettes. I always advise saving your entire show because, okay, if we now move on to loading, obviously saving, you would press save to save it, via loading you have those same options. Uh, I just noticed that uh, my, my lovely banner on my, uh, on my screen covers the loaded options there, uh, but you'll notice that the loaded options are the same as the save options. So actually, saving your entire show, when you want to load it back in, you can choose to load the entire show, the setup, or the setup and the palettes. Okay, so you've got those options within loading, so I would advise to save your entire show. Uh, again, you've got all your files here, obviously there's not too many on my local drive, but you would see all your different show files saved here. You go choose the one you want and load that in. Great stuff. Uh, a few other things we'll cover. Um, settings, a few basic settings in here. 
Uh, you've got things like changing the name of your desk. Here is where you've got date and time. You can choose to change the pin on your desk because you have got the ability to lock the console um, so that no one can alter your recording. Uh, you've got your external dis display setting so you can enable or disable the external display. And if it's an external touchscreen monitor, you can go ahead and calibrate it here because you have to calibrate it the first time you use it or any time you plug it back in. Uh, you've also got LCD, so this is your internal touchscreen. You can go and change the brightness of this um, you, uh, using that method there. And you would have seen a recording window popping up and down as we were doing various things. And you can choose if this displays on the internal or the external screen or both, or um, you can choose to change those options there. A couple of defaults. Hopefully you've seen most of these during the session. Uh, these are your fade times. So for example, if I prefer five second fade time rather than three, I could go ahead and make that change here before recording my cues so that I have those five seconds applied to every cue that I record thereafter. Uh, color fades and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, we also then got your clear options. Okay, so in here you've got mass ways of deleting. So you can clear all your color palettes, your beam palettes, your positions, your effects, your groups, your playbacks, everything. You can do a factory reset, a reset desk. All these should be nice and self explanatory uh, within the clear options. Okay, so these are just mass ways of deleting uh, across the console. Great stuff. Cool guys, so that, uh, I'm just going to close that down and come back out of setup. That is most things that I wanted to cover with you today. Uh, as I said, you would have seen, especially whilst we've been flicking through uh, different screen layouts and monitors and so on, there are things that we haven't covered today. Um, and that is purposely, this is a flex entry level course. This course was designed to uh, get you going, get you started. Um, but do feel free to ask us any questions in any of the comments, um, the comment boxes on any of the live streams. If we haven't answered your question live, okay, if you haven't had a chance to watch this live, do continue to post questions into those comments and either myself or one of the team, uh, we've all got access to those and we'll come back to you as soon as we can um, later, in, later, in the stage, later in stages to answer those questions. But that was Flex Entry Level. As I said, there are some other courses coming up during the week. Uh, we've got a um, Chases and um, Chases and Effects uh, live stream tomorrow. Um, that's with my colleague Edward. And I do believe we've also got a uh, Ethernet networking session uh, coming up tomorrow as well. All about how to use uh, Artnet, Streaming ACN, all those other protocols uh, that you may have seen in the uh, setup window there. But for today, guys, I don't see any more questions coming through, so we're going to call it there. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, do let us know if you've got any questions. I've been Tyler. Goodbye.